Joyce Ketra from Garden Studios. You're going to talk to us about EULAs, aren't you? You know, yes. and I'm studio, was up studio. Sorry. Well, well, I don't know that. You know, you might have already taken over the world. So, um, please give it up for Joyce, who will give us some legal insights. I suspect. Thanks, Bruno. All right, so I'm going to sit. All right, so I'm the, as Bruno said, I'm the CEO of Darden Studio. Please, if you can't hear me in the back, like start waving your hands, okay? All right, so I'm the CEO of Darden Studio, which is an independent, small independent foundry. I've been with the company for nine years in various roles. I've always been responsible for license enforcement and sales. We're very selective about our license enforcement. And I'm proud to say that in the past four years where we got really serious about license enforcement, of the 20 or so settlements that we've come to, the vast majority have decided <laughs> Sorry, peanut gallery in the front row. The vast majority have decided to continue and not cease use. Many of them making purchases in their settlement that were far more than were required to cure the violation. And many returning for large purchases after the fact, three this year alone. My work naturally leads to being the most directly involved with writing the EULA. However, I'm not a lawyer. I'll be talking about font licensing from the foundry and sales perspective. My opinions are formed by conversations, both with users who have explained to me what confused them, and also with our lawyer. But it should not be construed as legal advice. So what is a EULA, really? That's what it stands for. I think we all know that, right? When we talk about EULAs, when we use this word, I've noticed we all do this, and I'm going to be doing it in this talk, but it's important to say it. We're usually talking about, in cases where we're less creative than David, Jonathan, Ross, the first level desktop license, where in reality, any license issued to an end user is a EULA. So when we talk about a, a, web, embed, a web embedding license or an application license or what have you, a logos license, these things are EULAs. That's not what I'm talking about here. So whenever I talk about EULAs, I'm just talking about that first basic desktop. And sorry, I, I apologize. And it really is many things, that first basic desktop EULA. First and foremost, it's a contract granted in exchange for a fee, but it also defines the product list. This is what you have gotten for this fee. These are the things you could also buy in addition. And this all sounds really dry and frankly annoying, but when we talk about EULAs, one of the things I hear people repeating all the time like it's a spell to protect them from having to think more, is the EULA is the greatest expression of a foundry's values. And it sounds like garbage, doesn't it? It sounds like pretty fluffy words. It's actually true, both in form and in content. When I first entered the industry eight and a half years ago, we thought licensing was complicated and we had no idea. That was just before web fonts. It was before app embedding was a thing. And most of what we worried about then feels very basic now. I would never audit 
somebody just because I thought they might have used more, use, more installed the fonts on more CPUs than their license. That's just not enough for us to put that kind of energy into it. And there was a time even before my time when I think founders really wanted to believe that the EULA was a guide to users. But people hardly read EULAs, and that's not going to change. I think I can tell from other times I've talked about this. I think some of you probably came hoping I was going to talk to you about how to get users to read the EULA. Grieve that dream. Fonts are software now, and people don't read software licenses. The entire rest of the software industry has trained them not to, and taught them that they don't need to because the software protects itself. We still get technical support calls from people who are using other software wrong and can't say generate an embedded PDF and they think that it's because they need to buy additional permissions from us and get a new file. This is the level of user knowledge we're dealing with. Our lawyer who wrote our EULA, who defends our EULA, who explains it to other lawyers, doesn't read licenses when she installs software on her computer. The game is lost. If we can't get her to read EULAs, we're never getting anyone to read EULAs. But the conceit of the EULA is that it is written to be read. So let's think along these lines, a thought experiment. Writing 101 is who is your audience, right, when you're writing something? There's really three audiences for the EULA. There actually are companies, fewer than I would have guessed before I started doing this, fewer than I wish there were, that really do have their lawyer read the EULA before they make the purchase. Uh, these are not people I'm especially worried about, and we're not going to spend any more time talking about them. And I know you're thinking customers, but she just said customers don't read EULAs, right? This one's a bit indirect. They may not read the actual document, but maybe they read your FAQ. Our website has a sidebar on each font page explaining the most basic things you might need to know. Do you want to do web embedding? You know, do you have a large group? These kinds of things. And a lot of what we're talking about when we're talking about the EULA is in fact the set of rules that are contained within the document, not the document itself. And there, there are a lot of customers, many of them large, not all of them, who will even call you up and want hand-holding to help you walk them through those rules. And it's a good idea if they make sense and are easy for those people to follow. And those people are interacting with your EULA in an indirect way. But there is one time when people reliably read the actual document. And that brings us to the audience that we're going to spend the most time on. <laughs> There's more to the EULA than license enforcement. But the hard truth that this is that this is where it is most needed, most used, and most fragile. And the EULA is a sales tool. It's always a sales tool. I, it's not an accident. I started this talk by talking about how we've converted violations to sales. And I've heard other people talking about EULAs say the same thing. When used right, that's what it does. And it's also a sales tool when you're on the phone with a large customer. So, The violation is the worst case scenario, and that's what we're going to focus on. Let's pause for a moment and talk about violations. How they happen, what enforcement is like. Because the more we understand this, the more likely we are to write a good EULA for all audiences.
This is a phrase that's common in American speech. I'm not talking about Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> I'm talking about people who set out to do wrong, to steal. Their actions are bad. They are bad actors. And it's really, really tempting to think of license violators this way. Then we don't have to accommodate them. They're not people. They're monsters. But the truth of the matter is that large companies, and they're the only ones I'm concerned with, don't violate because they're out to get you. They violate because they're sloppy. So I talk about sloppy actors. In all of our license enforcements that we've done, we start to see trends. These are the companies least likely to have a style guide. We see non-uniform use across their websites, large international webs of websites. We had one with 980 something odd, really, seriously. And they're also the least likely to know what a font server is, which means they don't have basic ideas about how to do their own license maintenance. It's easy to start wondering how these companies stay in business. I'd never invest in any of them. And that doesn't excuse their behavior, but it does affect how we think about them, how I think about them, because they didn't set out to do us wrong. And if we assume they're bad actors, we don't have to do anything to accommodate them. No matter how clear our EULA is, they would violate it anyway. But the difference with a sloppy actor is when they're presented with a clear, understandable, sensible, intuitive even, EULA, they're going to work with you. That's how we get the sales. That's how we walk away with them liking us. So I like to talk about the retroactive reader. That's the people reading the license after the fact, after the violation. How does the philosophy of writing the EULA change if we think of it as being for after the violation? Well, your audience is in a compromised state. They've just been told they owe a lot of money that wasn't in the budget. They may be worried about losing their job. And that's a person who's going to be looking for traps, ways to say you're being unfair or to villainize you. Give them nothing. For years, the industry has talked about a user-friendly EULA to the extent that's possible in a legal document. And people have gone about this in different ways, but it always amounts to making sure that the individual clauses are comprehensible. I take that a step further. I want not for ju just for each clause to make sense, but for the whole thing to be a system that makes sense. Logos, large volume, and broadcast. Oh my. <laughs> I've been told when I was practicing that I should define these for people because they might not understand it in the audience. I'm not going to because that tells you something. If you, this audience, don't know what these mean, then what chance do our customers have? And what these are is they're examples of attempts to be fair. Ex the people who have clauses in their EULAs that call out these items as things that require additional pricing did so in an effort to control the price of the basic desktop EULA and charge more for things where they think there's greater value. And that's thinking about fairness in a very particular sort of way that doesn't take into account the fact that they're making a large tangled mess of <laughs> rules. In complexity lies confusion, and in confusion lies mistrust. Sorry, my thing's not cooperating. All right, if you think on the micro level, 
you wind up with a lot of fair or clever rules. They may seem to contradict each other, though, in the case, or they may leave things out. And at best, they require a lot of memorization that's really too much to ask of a person who's maybe making a lot of purchases or even just scoping out a lot of fonts. So third party communication was a big no-no in my household. You can't tell your mother how your sister's feeling because you will inevitably get it wrong and you'll cause a fight between the two of them. And unfortunately, font sales is all about third party communication. You're talking to an art director who has to sell it to a CFO. You're talking to a marketing agency who has to sell it to their client who doesn't want to talk to you because they don't think they should have to. And there's no way around this. So if you're going to have to engage in third party communication, I say keep it simple. We like to draw a clear line. There's probably a lot of different lines you can draw. The one we draw is all embedding requires an addendum. That's a clear, simple rule from which you essentially understand the whole rest of the EULA, or at least the part people care the most about. And there is an exception. You can ask me about it in the Q&A if you want. It's products. It really requires its whole own lecture, so we're not going to linger on it now. We don't have a problem from a user perspective with this exception. That may be partly due to the nature of the kinds of use cases we see in our fonts, but anyway, I've had the luxury of not having to dwell on this. Now, this is another word I was told might be difficult for non-native English speakers, but I left it in because it's a word that comes up when you're thinking about going to court. Punitive damages. It's damages over the value of the violation that are assessed specifically to punish. In some cases, probably not with fonts, but you hear about it, a court will assess punitive damages that are really a nuclear option. They are intended to bankrupt somebody. And I don't believe in punitive damages for fonts. It feels like a trap to the violator. They're going to say to themselves, oh, this foundry makes less money if I understand things. Of course it didn't make sense. And here I have to read something that was dictated to me by our lawyer. We're not here to talk about what you choose to bill and when you choose to bill it. What we're talking about here is what you do when there's a violation. Some foundries probably build the cost for license enforcement into their fees. Others charge punitively when there's a violation, usually multiples of the license cost. But like I said, that's the nuclear option. And the problem with nuclear bombs is you don't actually want to use them. It can be shaking a stick that will make you look foolish later. Because if they ignore you, you may have to go to court. And that might not be something you're willing to do. So instead, a thing you can do, what we do, is put, we require in our license that if we have to do anything in connection with an infringement that involves an attorney or an investigator, that we will collect the legal fees as a direct reimbursement. And we use that as an argument that we're one of the good guys. Legal fee reimbursement feels more fair because it's tied to the time that the license violator causes the settlement to take, and it can vary wildly. It's also really great from the foundry perspective, because if you're dealing with a large company with in-house counsel, it gets them to watch the clock with you instead of use it against you. So before your eyes glaze over, some of you may have noticed that I skipped a lot about legalese. It, it's not central to my point, but I want to touch on it for just a second. 
and say that this stuff is really important. It's not just about being professional and dotting your I's and crossing your T's, which it is, but it also can be the difference between a successful settlement and an unsuccessful one. Governing law, for instance, is something I notice a lot of foundries shy away from committing about. And we had one major settlement where if we had not had a strong governing law clause, I am absolutely convinced that we would not have been able to settle. The violator was terrified of having to go to New York. So, the moral of the story is that you make and sell fonts, not word processing software. And in a world where your software is essentially a plugin that can't protect itself, the EULA does matter. It's not just a collection of paragraphs, but a system of ideas that can either work together or not. Read and understand your EULA if you already have one. So it's not just a piece of gobbledygook you have to put up with, but an instrument that can help you to take advantage of sales opportunities when they come around. If a clause in your EULA seems confusing to you, it is. And your attorney probably needs to rewrite it. And I have a confession to make. I hadn't really sat with our EULA, not really, really sat with it in four years since we read it until the past couple months when I was preparing. I did two workshops, this lecture. And as I read it and as I sat with my students in my workshops, I realized I need to rewrite it. The order could be much more intuitive. The strong line could be much stronger. And to quote one of the participants in the workshop yesterday, we read three EULAs, which shall remain nameless, but which were all captains of the industry EULAs. The takeaway for that person was, they all need to be rewritten. <laughs> so come back to our website, not literally this space, but come back to our website in a couple months. and. I'll have something else because we can all continue to learn and grow. Thank you. Thank you, Choice. Well, we're switching computers and, and set up. Does anyone have a question, a short one? Choice? Yes. So these violators, let's say, uh -huh. how do you manage to get to the right person, to the decision makers, who you know, will actually then go with you potentially to either a sale or uh, to court? Well, we've never had to go to court. Okay. Um, and but it's not, but yeah, but I hear what you're saying. It's not easy. Um, we figured out pretty quickly that um, if we contacted them directly, unless we had already had contact with them, that that looked weak. So we always have our lawyer write a letter, but it's not a cease and desist letter and it's not a demand letter, it's just an exploratory letter. And so we're starting with lawyers talking to lawyers. And then we ask them to do a whole lot of research because where there's one violation, there's usually five. And then we end up getting connected um, to the department that is making those decisions. Where, where do you draw the line of enforcement? I know how much the average legal fees are for one of these settlements. And when I see a violation, I estimate the value of it. And if they're below the legal fees, I don't do anything unless they have done an unauthorized modification of our fonts, in which case we always send them a letter. But I'm thinking of something that appears hard to enforce, say you know that a big company in a faraway country uses your fonts openly and they definitely have no license. What do you do about it? Well, I haven't actually counted, but our enforcements have been in a plethora of countries. The only one that stymied us was Russia, and we did try. 
Thank you. Um, I'd like to question. Okay, is it short? Yeah. Okay. Um, it sounds like by your description of Euler's as ideally a, a system of ideas, which I like that phrase a lot, that you you wouldn't be a fan of checkbox systems for license construction, which is something that some industry players have been considering. I don't know if they exist, but so. um, probably not. I think it would depend on exactly how it was implemented. Um, I. Ha we talked yesterday, and what I think he's going to say is something that I think is a really good idea. So, um, but but it's but it's not you know it it, it no I, I think that you have to be very careful about not thinking on the micro level too much. Yeah, this was the perfect segue, so to say, to <laughs> CJ's talk. Thank you, uh, Choice. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we continue with Euler's a little bit, uh, and it's going to be a little bit of a modular model, maybe. Uh, CJ Dunn. 